record on this computer. And we are live. It's 10 past and it's time for the nib forecast as our friend Scribble said. And with that, I am going to start another lovely evening with 12 days of fountain pens with it tonight we're going to be with Phil Dart from Belfort Inks. He is the man who has the Palladium nibs. Go there. They are amazing. They are, he also has titanium nibs, platinum nibs, white gold nibs, all sorts of nibs. Go to his shop and buy yourself a nib and pens and inks and supplies. Why not? Uh, we are sponsored by Robert Oster, which kindly is releasing his citrus, citrus ink with us. Um, it's the first release. So people from all, all over the world are going to envy us until January when they are able to buy. But at the moment, only who wins this ink can have it. And to win the ink, you all know, you send an, e uh, an email to 12 days of phantom pen at bemed.io. You've been doing that since the beginning and you've been winning that since the beginning. And we are also sponsored by Dan Spence, the great Dennis, the emperor of Dan Spence, kindly donated this wonderful Vanagant to be a prize on our quiz. And it's a wonderful pen that sports a nib from Phil. It's a buck nib that he got with Phil. We also sponsored by Gramia Pens, which kindly sent us this Lalex, this Jinhao 159, was already one, I need to ship it. A pocket 25, that was already one as well. And this Lalex pen is sterling silver. Ta da! I need. We're also sponsored by Izods. Rod, kindly enough, Roy, kindly enough, donated us to us a pen that I'm still need to decide and choose between the options that he gave me. My bad, I know, but you know, here we go. And we're also sponsored by Dragon Meat, uh, where John Dodd kindly provided us with this Zoom account so we are able to record this. So without further delays, it's 15 past and it's time to talk about nibs and to hear the rumblings of a nib bonger. Feel that. Please entertain yourself. Oh, blimey. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> you can say whatever you want, uh, your rumblings. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Well, thanks, Bernardo. And um, thanks very much for the invite. It's appreciated. And, uh, and above all, actually, thanks very much indeed for, uh, for organizing this whole event. It's been, I've been at all but one of them, but I've watched the one that I, I wasn't present at, and it's been extremely enlightening and entertaining every day. And so, thanks very much indeed for organising this. It's uh, it's appreciated, certainly by me, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say by everybody. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Phil Dart. I am from a company called Beaufort Inc. Uh, lots of you will know about us because of our association with Bok Nibs. Um, we are involved in pen making at all sorts of levels as well. We don't make pens ourselves, uh, but we're involved with pen makers at all sorts of levels, um, both on a, a sort of artisan level, people in their studios and, and sheds and workshops and things. Um, and also with um, a few commercial makers who are making on a, a, a on a commercial basis, most of whom we're not allowed to mention, but we do work with some of them. Um, the Ramblings of a Nibmonger, that was my title, uh, which I gave to Bernardo. I'm surprised I got away with it, to be honest, because 
he hasn't got a clue what I'm going to talk about. Um, he assumes I'm going to talk about nibs, which I may do, but I could talk about the weather um, or football maybe. Um, <laughs> don't look like that. I, anybody who knows me knows it's extremely unlikely that I'm going to talk about football because I believe that it should be banned in public spaces. Um, which I accept is a minority view, but nonetheless, um, there we are. So what I am going to do is tell you a little bit about myself. Can you all hear me all right, by the way? <clears throat> yeah. I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about myself um, and explain how that has influenced uh, what we do here at Beaufort Inc. Um, and then uh, show you how that filters through to the, the sort of the pen making scene. Um, I call it a scene that um, more this evening in regard to um, the, the, the many wonderful artisan makers that are around at the moment um, who are making pens in their, well, in their sheds, basically, most of them, um, one of whom demonstrated to us the other night, Den, from Den's Pens. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, probably a good opportunity then to take any questions that anybody's got. And then if we've got time after that, I will talk about nibs if you if you'd like me to, and if we've got time, um, just just in very general terms, so that people understand the differences between this size and that size, and this metal and that metal, and so on, so that you can um, uh, look at nib. I, I know a lot of you will know that already, but um, some of you may benefit from it. But if we've got time, and if you want me to, we'll do that as well. Um, so I am a pen owner, a fountain pen owner. Um, well, big pencils as well, obviously you've seen those. Um, I'm a fountain pen owner and user and enthusiast. Um, I've learned over the last several days that there are some super enthusiasts here. Um, I'm an enthusiast. Um, my first pen, we were all, it was compulsory to write with a fountain pen when I was at school. And my first pen, I think, was a platignum. I'm pretty certain it was a platignum. It went out of business many years ago. I've no idea what happened to my platignum. Um, I probably had several, if the truth's known, because I can't imagine that that I looked after it terribly well. <clears throat> um, blue ink, we had all, all had to write with blue ink. There was no choice in that. Um, and I was delighted, probably about a year ago, to stumble across a platignum in um, an antique shop which of course I had to buy. It was three pounds uh, which in terms of pound notes was probably many times more than my parents would have paid for the platignum in the first place when I was a schoolboy. Um, it doesn't work, it, the, the sack's in trouble, it's got all sorts of problems, I've never had time to sort it out but nonetheless um, I, I'm, I'm the proud owner of a platignum again, so that, and that will stay with me even if I never get to mend it, which hopefully one day I will, or I might give it to Noah and he can do it for me. And then he'll charge me probably many, many times more than, <laughs> than I paid for the pen. Um, my background though, my training originally was in violin restoration. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, way. <laughs> so you're a violinist? Yeah. Um, I, that's how I earned my living for many, many years. Uh, I had a studio in a little town called Godalming, which is, um, loads of people know where Godalming is. I'm, I'm not quite sure why they know where Godalming is, but for anybody who doesn't, or is not in uh, England, it's, it's about 30 miles south of London. It's in the home counties. Um, and that's how I learned my living, earned my living for many, many years. Uh, Godalming's claim to fame is that it was the first town in England, probably the UK, I don't know that, but certainly in England, to have electric street lighting. So there we are. Um, anyway, in about 2000, um, my family and I made the decision for various reasons that we were going to move to the highlands of Scotland, which we did. Uh, and we lived um, right in the heart of the highlands, just north of a, a, a town called Fort William, which is um, where all the big mountains are and so on. Um, in terms of players per head, there are probably more people in the Highlands, possibly with the exception of Ireland, that play the violin than anywhere else. It's just that there are fewer people there in the first place. 
um, my nearest big town down at Godalming was a place called Guildford and the population of that was 250,000 people, I suppose, at the time. The whole of the West Highlands, probably 30,000 people, not very many at all. So, so carrying on with the violins wasn't viable. Um, and I pretty soon realised that I didn't have anything creative to do. Um, I had nothing to do with my hands, basically. So I already knew how to turn on a lathe and I, I, I had to do a little bit of turning in my, in my work anyway. So I bought myself a bigger lathe um, and I got involved in making bowls and platters and all that kind of thing. And uh, we were in the heart of the, 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 the tourist area. So I was making little trinkets for the tourist industry and selling them through gift shops and um, visitor attractions and hotel foyers and all that kind of thing. <clears throat> and a fairly big branch of wood turning, if you'll pardon the pun, is is making pens, pen turning, but making pens from from pen kits. I'm not going to dwell on pen kits too much, I promise you. But making pens from pen kits is a is a popular way of people passing their time, um, and it's something that I vowed I would never ever do, because it's 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 quite simple turning, um, and it it didn't interest me that much. So I was never going to get involved in it. So anyway, I turned a pen, of course, um, and uh, several, in fact, and I made them from the cask, the, the staves, I should say, of whiskey casks. And I put those into the same tourist shops and visitor centers and so on. And I found actually that they sold much more easily than the bowls and the tourist trinkets and so on and actually they were a bit more profitable as well so I made some more and so it went on but I had uh, for myself I had problems in my own head with these these pen kits that I was using um, and the first one of them was that the refills in, in in terms of the ball points and the roller balls I know we, we, we don't like to mention those words here but in terms of the the ball the, the ball points and the roller balls the refills that came with these kits were utterly atrocious they were shocking they were scratchy and horrible it's half the time they didn't work and if they did work they ran out of ink within nanoseconds because there was hardly any in there and they were mainly just fresh air and wadding so i used to i used to chuck those out and um, and this bear in mind this was a lot of years ago the internet wasn't then what it is now you didn't have access to all this stuff worldwide it was it was fairly well not embryonic it was beyond embryonic but it was a, a shadow of what the internet is now um so i used to get refills from the high street um all these branded refills parker and so on and i was paying frankly more for the refill than i was for the pen um so they used to go into these pens in order to make them into a decent writing instrument uh, which used to cut down on my profit. And that's what I did for a long, long time until it dawned on me that really we should be looking into ways of um, producing refills for ourselves. Um, we, I got to a stage where I was making probably six, seven, eight, nine, ten pens a day um, just to keep up with demand. Uh, and so that's, that's a lot of refills. Um, so we looked at the the did a lot of research and homework spoke to a lot of people um and came up with a specification and eventually started producing albeit in other people's factories but we started producing refills for um ballpoint pens and rollables so they went into my pens and it was much more economical and then i realized of course that there is economy in numbers um, so we upped the game um, and started selling them to other people who might want to do the same kind of thing. And that's how Beaufort Inc. started. Um, we actually started selling ballpoint uh, refills for Parker pens and cross pens and rollable refills. And it's still quite a big part of the business today. Um, but I wasn't only making ballpoints and rollables, you'll be pleased to learn, because I was making fountain pens as well. And one of the other problems I had was 
similar to the ball points, the nibs that came with these fountain pen kits were appalling. They were the cheapest of the cheapest of the cheapest IPG nibs. Um, thin and tinny and scratchy and horrible. If they wrote, you were lucky. Um, they weren't pens. They were, they were, you know, you had to tweak these nibs an awful lot to get anything out of them at all. So that had to change as well. So we uh, had long discussions with, with Bok um, and we took on their nibs on the Bayfort Inc. website, um, first of all, in a fairly small way. And that um, over time has grown and grown and grown to the point that we are, I don't know that we're the largest, but we are certainly one of the largest nib um, retailers worldwide, I would say. Um, the other problem I had with these kits was the kits themselves, the quality of the components and the plating. And at the time, um, the market was dominated by cheap imports from China um, that weren't particularly well made. It was possible to get better quality components from American firms. They were still matched, manufactured in the Far East, but they were manufactured in Taiwan rather than in China, where the, where the, the quality of manufacturing, the manufacturing base is that much better. Um, so you could get them from the States and there were one or two people who, who resold them in this country, but the choice wasn't great. Um, and the, the ethos at the time amongst people making this stuff was obviously there are exceptions but the the attitude was buy a pen kit and make it in the shed for something to do on a Sunday afternoon uh, rather than buy a pen kit and make a pen because I want to make a nice writing instrument and the the common question you used to get amongst fellow pen makers was where's the cheapest place to buy a pen kit rather than you know where's the best place to buy a pen kit that I can make a nice pen from so the market was dominated by very, very cheap and nasty stuff. Um, and so we decided to change that as well. Um, and at the time, uh, well, an expensive fountain pen kit would have cost you seven, eight, nine, uh, 10 pounds was a lot of money to pay for a fountain pen kit. So I designed some fountain pen kits and we brought them to the market. The first one we introduced was £22.95, which was more than twice the price of the most expensive one available. But the engineering was spot on, the tolerances in the engineering, the quality of the plating. You could make a pen kit from a pen from it that was, was going to bend, turn out to be um, a good writing instrument. It had a bot nib in the front um, and they made nice pens and we still sell those today. And so we managed to, I mean, we took a lot of stick for, for the pricing to start with because people were saying, how much you're never going to survive with it? What a load of old rubbish. But gradually, 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 people realised that if they paid more for the components that they were making their pens from, um, they were going to get a better pen. And gradually, the, the, the thinking changed away from making something in the shed on a Sunday afternoon that you can look at and think is nice and pretty to making something that can be a nice writing instrument at the end of it. And so gradually we change people's perceptions um, of what they should be buying in terms of pen kits. The, the, there is a limitation with a pen kit in terms of its design and in terms of its functionality. The nature of a pen kit is um, you may or may not know this, but basically you get a set of components in a bag, which includes a brass tube. Um, so you take the material from which you're going to make the barrel and the cap of your pen and you drill a hole through the middle and you glue the tube in and trim it to length, put it on your lathe, turn it to shape and finish it, and then you press the components in the end of it to make your pen. Um, there are limitations to that because you've got to always allow for somebody to, to, to make this barrel and make this cap. So you're always going to get, for instance, a little bit of a step down from the barrel to the section. And there's not a great deal you can do about that when you're designing a pen kit, because you've got to allow somebody to put something over the top of the tube. Um, you're always going to get a little bit of weight associated with it, because underneath the components, they're generally brass and they're plated on top. So a, a kit made, a pen made from a kit is 
probably going to be heavier than a lot of fountain pen enthusiasts would want to buy. Um, and there are other limitations with them as well. So these these pen kits are they go really well at craft markets and you know all the posh county shows and the horse of the year and all that kind of thing. Uh, and they're very popular. But if somebody set up a stand of those at the London Pen Show, for instance, they're probably not going to sell any. Um, <clears throat> so the next step for me as a pen maker was to make a pen from first principles without any kit involved. I didn't want to be able to, I didn't want to have to take things out of the bag and press them in. I wanted to make the whole lot myself because we had a warehouse full of nibs. We had a warehouse full of um, materials from which to make uh, these pens, you know, the resin blanks and all that kind of thing. Um, and I looked up to realize that the, I, I, could, I didn't have access to any thread taps to, to make the inside of a section. The, 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 the housing's got a thread on it. I've got to make the inside of a section in order to screw it in. Where am I going to get the thread tap? And I couldn't. Where am I going to get the taps to get uh, and the taps and dies to make the caps. I couldn't. It's not quite true. If you hunted, if you knew where to hunt, you could find one or two of them um, from a couple of places in the States. So you had to go through all that to get them in and import them and all the duty and all the VAT and all the rest of it. So again, we looked around um, and spoke to a lot of people and eventually we commissioned um, these specialist thread taps to be made. Um, to, to correspond with the threads on uh, nip housings, to correspond with all the correct sizes that you're going to need to make a cap from, um, to make a, a multiple start thread so that you don't have to spend all morning taking the cap on and off. Um, and so I started making pens that way. And we put them on the website, of course. Um, and other people slowly there were people making pens from first principles already. I'd be lying if I said they weren't, but there were some. But they, it was a difficult job for them because they had to source all this stuff from elsewhere. Um, but gradually, people um, decided that they would experiment with making pens in that way as well. And so they started buying these thread taps um, and the other tooling that we produced. And we started introducing um, resin blanks that were long enough to make an entire pen from because previously you could only make them get them long enough to make a pen kit from you need something substantially longer to make an entire pen including the section um, so we introduced we started building up a, a, a portfolio of all of this stuff that people need to make pens from first principles and people started to buy it and they would ring up and ask how you do this and how you do that and what's the best thread size to do this and they go away and beaver away in their sheds, threading this and threading that and cutting this and polishing that and chucking it in the bin because it didn't work. And then they'd have another go. And um, then they'd ring up again and say, and I'd say, well, make it half a millimeter shorter and you'll be okay. And then, the, and eventually they got to a stage where um, they could stand up and, and wander out of the workshop into the house to their best beloved and say, look, um, and they would brandish um, what, Anthony Newman um, described in one of his recent blogs, quite disparagingly, I thought actually, as um, a nib on a stick. Um, in fact, a, a nib on a stick with a with a lid, because uh, that's what these these guys are making. There's there's a lot there's a huge learning curve involved in doing this stuff. You've got to get your head around all sorts of things. So you can't knock a nib on a stick. From their point of view, it's an enormous achievement, and it really is an enormous achievement. But if we um, just go back to the violins briefly, um, I was a violin restorer. That's a, that's a very grand name, really, for a violin repairer. You spend most of your time keeping instruments on the road, and I had, I had customers at the Royal Opera House and symphony orchestras and the British Army, they gave me a lot of work because they have um, sat on orchestras and concert orchestras and that kind of thing. But the, the bread and butter, the day-to-day the, the -day bread and butter was dealing with music teachers and schools and music shops and, and keeping 
instruments in in good condition when when Jessica sits on it you know you've got to mend it um, or the bone needs rehairing and so on but inevitably you you come across a lot of instruments that are frankly not very good um, they're cheap uh, the quality isn't great and they're the sort of instrument that if you know, if you're if you're learning to play if you show any aptitude at all you want to sort of move on from as quickly as you can really because there'll come a point where your capabilities will will exceed what the instrument can give you and so it is with these nibs on a stick you've got to be you've got to be glad for those you've got to be grateful for those um those cheap violins because without them we would be minus an awful lot of musicians because you know so many of them learn on these cheap instruments and they progress on so it is with these nibs on a stick you've got to be grateful for them because without them we would not have um the the, the some of the great makers that we've got now because a lot of people are happy to um to carry on making nibs on a stick they'll refine it a bit and it will be a, a, a nib on a stick with a levels but they'll you know they'll keep doing that they'll they'll they give them to their friends and family and so on and it's their hobby it's their time it's their enjoyment it's their sense of fulfillment and good for them they're enjoying themselves um and we should be grateful for them but there are some people who uh, are able to get their heads around all of that and then combine it with some artistry as well so they'll refine their techniques um, and refine what they're doing uh, to a point that they can combine that with finesse. Um, you know, a little turn here, a little twist there. Um, we watched in the other day with a file, no less, turn the finial on a barrel brilliantly and it took him, oh, I can't remember, not very long at all, but you know. But somebody starting out just wouldn't do that. They wouldn't think of doing that. Uh, so people people move on and they uh, and their creativity grows with it. Um, and as a result, we are blessed now with really quite a large number of talented artisan uh, pen makers. Um, and I know it's it's uh, there were people doing this to a, a, a small extent before we got involved. Um, and I know it sounds conceited, but I am quite proud to say that we've had quite an influence um, in the availability of these artisan pens, because it all stems back really to um, the fact that once upon a time, against my better judgment, I made a, a pen from a kit that had a rubbish refill in it, because that's where it all stems from. Um, but I've got here, how are we doing for time? Gosh, I've been rabbiting on for a long time. I've got, can I share a screen, Bernardo? Can I just get on and do that? Or do you need, do I need input from you? Uh, yes, I'm going to give you a host and then you share the screen. Okay. Um, okay. Hang on then. You are the host now. You can share the screen. Oh. Um, all right, here we are. Have you got that? Yep. You got some pens there? I, I wish I had that one. Mine is <laughs> mine is still on Royal Mail. Ah, uh, I'll sell you mine if you like. Oh, definitely. Three three hundred. Uh, okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm uh, just gonna. I'm just instead of reading off a list of names, I'm gonna. I I, I found some photographs this afternoon, so I thought it'd just be fun to share some of these with with people, and you can see the sort of thing that is being made not just here but around the world um these i think probably need no introduction um these are john garnham's um it's a jg6 um and that is a material called teal pearl i had a photograph of a john garnham in another color as well but i thought i'd say it was teal pearl just in case bernardo's nodded off and it might mess him <laughs> up with the word teal uh, no, no, um, no. My, mine literally got lost on Royal Mail. I still have the tracking. It? Yeah. On the 10th of February next year, it's going to make a year. <laughs> really? Can I have yeah. a birthday? Oh, 
Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll give, I'll let mine, I'll let John have mine and you can rent it from him. How's that? <laughs> um, anyway, John is um, a, a, a talented maker. This is his JG6. Um, I've got a couple of JG6s. Um, I've got a JG8 as well. Has, has, has everybody got, has he sent out all his JG8s now or, is, or not? No, my mine is depending on material. <coughs> right, so there's still some to go out. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, everybody knows the JG6, and John is um, a rock star on FP UK. Um, this is actually a video, so I'm going to have to wait a few seconds for that just to scroll on. Um, and then I'll stop it again. Okay, I know there's at least one person here who will recognise that. Uh, that's Dennis Hum. Um, Dennis makes a lot of his own resins. Um, he buys in a lot as well. Uh, that he, he's got he's got um, various sort of set models. I, I think that's probably a custom uh, a, a custom design because I couldn't find it amongst his other models. But I put it there because I quite like the shape. Uh, and then demonstrated to us the other night, uh, which was a fascinating demonstration. So I put that there because, um, uh, well, there we are, it's a den pen. Um, hang on a minute, I've got too many things open here. Just going to do a bit of shuffling, there we are. Um, right, who have we got next? Uh, that's a chap called Pierre Bouillet. Uh, he works in France. Um, he, he, as a mate of his, casts the resin for him. So it's a, it's a sort of non repeatable resin. But that's Pierre's kind of um, signature. He, he always puts these contrasting finials on and these contrasting accents, uh, not necessarily in white. Um, but I like that one. Uh, it's it's it looks quite retro to me it's um i think it's a classy pen um anyway that's pierre bouillet he works in france uh who have we got next oh uh, yes um this is a fellow called marmet keka he is in turkey he works in turkey um i think it's probably more to turkish taste because of that clip but you can see he's an artist um, and all of that is made by him, including the clip. Um, it may not appeal to Western tastes, I think. I can't see many of you now to see your faces because my screen's being shared. But um, anyway, he's a talented maker. Mehmet Kekar in Turkey. Um, what have we got next? Uh, right, um, John Sanderson. John Sanderson is in Rotherham. He's a talented maker. Uh, he's just moving to Cornwall, actually, and so he's had to shut up his workshop for a while. Um, so you won't be able to get a pen from him for a little bit. He uses um, something called Argentum Silver, which is a which is a form of silver, but it doesn't tarnish. Uh, well, I don't think it tarnishes at all, actually. It's, it still has a high silver content, but the alloy is slightly different. Um, there's actually a two piece barrel. Uh, with accents either end of it. If you look carefully, you can just see a join there. Um, he experimented with that for a while. It was a design thing more than a, a functionality thing. Um, but he makes some fantastic, fantastic pens. He also makes them um, in wood. So that's um, John Sanderson, silver bell pens. Ah, uh, yes, Duncan Hopkinson. Um, he is in Aberdeen. Um, he makes some cracking stuff, very modern designs. That's Ebonite. Um, and that is a, a hand hammered copper clip. Um, absolutely lovely designs he has. Um, Duncan Hopkinson in Aberdeen. He, Clyde Pens, he's called Clyde Pen Company. Um, who's that? Brian Lucas. Uh, that's a material called Pebble Beach. Um, you can see all these, can you see these blue kind of purpley shimmery things? Um, when you when you rotate the pen in the light, it, the, the iridescence that comes off those is, is delightful. Um, 
Uh, I put that there for two reasons. Um, one, because it's a nice pen. Ryan Lucas is a talented maker. And second, because um, a group of us who are giving these talks were having a discussion about the pronunciation of various towns and cities, Leicester and Bicester and so on. And uh, so the other reason I put this here is because Brian works in Worcester. There we are. There we are, Bernardo. Um, you learn a new thing every day. There you go. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan Tello. He's in Italy. Um, it's quite an interesting setup they've got there because um, John is employed by um, a foundation, a charitable foundation. Um, he he and another chap run the foundation, so effectively employs himself. But the 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 foundation, the, all the profits that from these pens uh, go into the foundation to the ben I can't remember exactly the the, the foundation, but it, essentially it's for the benefit of underprivileged kids in Italy. Um, that's a fantastic pen. It's a little bit unorthodox. Look, you've got the, the cap thread on the front of the section. Um, I have a feeling it's an eyedropper. Um, it's certainly a demonstrator that's a very translucent material. I can't tell you what the material is. I think he probably cast it himself. Um, so that's um, John Tello from Testori Pens in Italy. Um, what's next? Oh, there we are, Brad Harrington. Um, I think I saw a couple of Brad Harringtons on FP UK the other day. Brad is in Cambridge. Um, he specialises in wooden pens. He does make them from other things as well, but his, his speciality is wooden pens. That is all one, it's obviously there's a separate section, but the wood is, is one piece. That's not pieces of wood put together and it's not pieces of wood that are stained or coloured. Um, it's, it's the difference between the sap wood and the heart wood of, of, of the piece of wood that is used. Um, they're beautiful pens, they're nice to write with and they're quite lightweight as well. That I believe is a wood called Amboina. Um, so that is Brad Harrington, he's in Cambridge. Um, Gilbert House Pens is, is what he trades as. Who else have we got? Um, oh, Greg Hardy, he's in the USA. Uh, he's been through uh, a few phases. Um, he, 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 did, he went through a Celtic phase for a long time. Everything was Celtic on it. I've got one of his Celtic pens with a nice Celtic clip and nice Celtic finials and so on. I don't know if that particular style has a name, but he's got quite distinctive um, finials on the cap and, the, uh, and on the barrel. Um, it's just a nice looking pen. Um, so that's Greg Hardy, Hardy Pen writes. Oh, Nabi Destram, he's in Belgium. Um, that's a material called Acid Storm, I think. It's quite a distinctive shape again. You can see it's, it's uh, trapezoid, would that be the word? It's tapered anyway. Um, he is busy experimenting at the moment with filigree sleeves, acrylic filigree sleeves to go over the barrel. Not, not that would interfere with any way you hold the pen, but um, they do look quite attractive. Um, so he's another talented guy, Nabi Destrom. He's, he has a company called Wet and Wise in Belgium. Um, uh, any, any guesses, anybody? Go on. That's a Jake Lazary pen. It is Jake Lazary, yeah. Um, Jake was one of the first people we worked with when we got all this stuff together. Um, Jake's a, a, a silversmith. I don't know if smith is the right word, but he's certainly an artist with silver. Um, and he decided he wanted to make pens. And I remember having a conversation with him years ago um, that it was taking him a week to make a pen. When he first started out um, and then I remember having a conversation with him so quite some time later where he's told me that not pen not pens like this because there's a, a lot of handwork in this I mean that cap for instance you can't do that 
you can't finish that on a lathe. That's all cut by hand and sculpted by hand and finished by hand. So there's an awful lot of work in that. Um, but pens that were round, essentially, he was te he told me that he had managed to refine his techniques and his working practices um, to the point that he could make four a day, which was going some. And they are all lovely. And I um, the other day, after Scribbles quit, um, Scribble showed us some highlights from the United Inkdom archive. And I noticed then that uh, there was a, a Jacob Azari came up and I saw people's faces because I had, you know, I, then I could see everybody and people were going, oh yeah, gimme, 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 I want a Jacob Azari. Um, so yeah, he's a bit of a rock star, Jake. That's all Ebonite, by the way. It's a, it's a cracking pen. Um, and then I think last but not least, is this one there we are that's a chap called uh vaselin ephraim he's in russia and if you want um uh what's the word i'm looking for um steampunk there we are if you want steampunk he is the steampunk king i imagine that's quite a heady pen because it's all brass uh it's brass and ebonite in fact but it, every single part of that apart from the nib obviously uh, is made by hand by him. So he's made he made a sleeve first of all here and cut out this sort of arch thing, uh, and inside is uh, gauze. And then he's made these um, these crowns either end of the cap and the barrel and pierced them, and they're all hammered and so on. Um, and you can even the detail look just little dots and lines and things on the way he's fixed the clip on. The clip is very sort of steampunk. Um, so if you like heavy pens and you like steampunk, then He's definitely the man to go for. Um, uh, that's all the photographs I've got. I, I should say that, um, well, there may be people here. I don't know. I can't see exactly who's here. There may be people here watching who make pens who I haven't mentioned, in which case I apologise. I'm sorry. And I, I also, I think I need to point out that there are um, quite a few ladies making pens as well. All those pens, I'm afraid, were made by chaps but um, there are quite a few ladies now making pens as well. Um, and they're making nice pens too. So um, there we are. Bernardo, do we, do we want to have some questions? If you want uh, to answer there questions. questions. There may not be any. If, if you want to answer questions, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then if we've got time, I'll, we'll have a, look at, a quick look at some nids if, if, if you want me to. Sure. I'm gonna get the the draw for the winners for tonight. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whilst you answer the questions, Jose, you can start with your question. Hey Phil. Hi. Uh, I actually forgot to to ask you before this. Um, what? How? How's dealing with Bok in terms of the uh, distributing the nibs? What What kind of process is that? In terms of of distributing the nibs. How do you mean? Uh, being a dealer for uh, box nibs. Well, they are, they're not the easiest company to deal with, I have to say, because you're <laughs> paying them um, an awful lot of money up front. And, you know, when they're ready to ship your nibs, they ship your nibs. Um, but yes, I mean, we've been dealing with them for a long time, uh, quite a few years now. So we have, I suppose, influence is too strong a word, but we, we do get to talk with them. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know why the the Palladian nibs are being discontinued? Yeah, it's it's manufacturing really. It's um, I think they found that they were just too difficult to control in manufacturing because they are. Uh, you're going to find this out probably tomorrow, but they are quite a soft nib. Yeah. Um, they are they are difficult to i mean we always have a look at nibs before they go out the door here um and they are quite difficult to 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 tune and to sort out and to and to keep tuned because they are quite soft they're easy to spring they 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 are beautiful to write with um they're as going back to a pervers talk yesterday they're not flex nibs but they do flex um but you've got to be careful with them i mean there's a there's a lot of give in the times and you can get a lot of line variation from them but if you overdo it um and i mean you can actually you could you could bend the tines like that 
just with your fingers quite easily. They are very soft. So I think from a manufacturing point of view, and I think from also the point of view of, of securing um, a repeatable supply of quality palladium, they decided just to give up in the end. It's a great shame. Um, it's a shame. We, yeah, we, we, when we knew, we bought all that they had. We bought the whole lot. <laughs> um, and we've got very few left now. Um, so when they're gone, I'm afraid they're gone. Oh, it happens. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? No one? Wow. Okay, so you have uh, five minutes, five more minutes to send an okay. email. All right. And not, not you, Phil. They have five more minutes to send an email. Oh, sorry, right. To, oh, I'm for the ink draw. <laughs> no, you can talk for as long as you want. Oh, okay. And uh, if, if you, we don't have any more questions, please show us some nibs. Okay, well, um, I'm gonna see if I can remember how to swap cameras, hang on. There we are. Yes, yes? Yes, yes. Okay, um, well, I'm not gonna go into nibs in any great depth, I'm not gonna, um, because you know most of you know as much or more than I do um, but some people might find it useful um, I'll just show you a little bit about sizes first of all let me just clear the decks a wee bit um, the mainstay of most of the commercial world is um, is a size six nib uh, that's a that's a that's a steel nib I'm just going to take that out of its housing a moment um, and it's called a size six nib because it fits on a housing, uh, a pick apart on a feed that is nominally six millimeters in diameter. Um, so that you'll find that the, the, the radius of the back end of, where's the camera, there we are, the radius of the back end of the nib is nominally three millimeters to fit on a six millimeter feed. Um, if you measured that, you'll find it's not six millimeters, but nominally is six millimeters. Um, is it's a Western six size six nib is thirty five millimeters long. Um, and if you ever get into discussions with somebody in the Far East who's selling you a pen or selling you a nib, they refer to them as thirty five millimeter nibs. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you're talking with Moon Man or Pins BBS, whoever it is, and they want to sell you a 35 millimeter nib, that's what it is. It's a size six nib. Um, and you find those in, well, all sorts of pens, both, both Far Eastern and Western pens. Um, the, I, I meant to bring in an IPG nib to show you as well, just to show you the, the geometry, which is identical because IPG nibs are basically copies of Western nibs. So um, you'll find Western nibs in, uh, in a lot of pens uh, and you can swap them for another size six. Um, but the stuff that's coming in from um, other places as well, that I've mentioned a couple, you know, pens BBS and Moon Man and uh, all the rest of them. Uh, Jin Hao, uh, there are loads of them. You can, you can easily just whip out the nib that's in the front of that if you don't like it and you can swap in. You have to swap it, you can't put the, you can't put the housing in there as well because the thread is different. Um, but you can easily swap a Bok size six into an awful lot of these um, uh, Far Eastern pens that are coming into the country. Um, I'll show you a size five to, to give you a comparison. Um, there's a five, it's a lot shorter uh, it's 26 millimeters, and again the same rationale. If you're talking to somebody in the forest, they'd call it a 26 millimeter nib, um, and it's on a it's on a five millimeter feed. Um, but it's the it's the it's the diameter, it's the radius, I should say, of um, the the back of the nib that more or less dictates the size. Um, and just because it's a size five nib doesn't mean to say it has to look the same. I'm just going to have a rummage in my little pot here um, because that is also a size five nib. 
Um, let's let's um, get those out of the way. Um, and you can see, if I just take that out, they're both size five nibs. They both fit in the same housing and they both fit in the same feed. Can you see that? One of them though, I need my trusty big pencil. Here we are. This one here, this is, this is what Bob called an 076. It's got a much, much wider shoulder than this one, which they call a type 180. Um, you get, you find this, uh, just to put that in perspective, um, a lot of the Viscontis have these in, uh, the Rembrandts and the Van Goghs and so on. Um, they've got that wider shoulder. And in the front of a pen, it looks a much more substantial nib. I keep trying to persuade pen makers to try and to, to use these as well, because it looks a much more substantial nib. It behaves more or less the same as the 180, but it looks a much more substantial nib than, than, than the standard one. This is the one that all the IPGs copy. So if you, if you, uh, if you want to replace a nib, the, a size five nib, there's a very good chance that this is the one uh, that you're going to need. But this is quite a popular nib now as well. Um, and there's another one here, which, um, which is a little baby. I'll show it to you first of all inside the housing. It's a tiny little nib, and that's what they call an 060. Let me take that out. Um, whoops, sorry. And you can see how much smaller it is. It, it's, it's the same radius underneath. It's still a size 5 nib. That is um, the same nib that you will get in 75% of Kaveco's output. Um, is that little nib, it's, a, it's, a, it's an 060. Um, some of their other ones use a different nib, the Supra uses a different nib, for instance, but most of them, are, you know, the Sport and the, and the Student and, and the Dyer and all the rest of them, um, they all come with that nib in a box housing, so you can just swap those um, for all you like. Um, I have got a Palladium here, actually, Jose. <laughs> um, Oh no, actually I've just un uncapped a, um, a titanium. Let me, let me scoot that out of the way. This is the titanium. This is sort of crossing over a little bit with what Perva was doing yesterday. Um, so they're not flex nibs. They bulk market them as semi-flex. And they do flex, but you know, don't overdo it. These aren't like the old um, vintage nibs. But you can see, you know, without much effort you can do that to it really quite easily um you know you can get that out of it and there's no damage to the nib so they are they are quite sort of soft under the hand and they will go back to go back to uh, a closed time uh, as long as you don't overdo it but you can get quite a nice nib variation out of them but they are you, you get a, a bit of feedback from them um there's, did I, have I got a, no I haven't, that's just a standard box steel actually, you can get a fair bit of, no you can't even see that, hang on, um, you can get a fair bit of line variation out of those without spreeing them. Uh, oh. You're writing too much on top of the paper, so, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah now we can see. Yeah, I'm doing this at a funny angle I'm afraid because the camera's um, just a just a standard. Yeah, steel. you can get a. They're not, you know, don't overdo them. There's this great thing at the moment. It always tempting to think there's this great thing about everybody wanting flex nibs. Um, because there are there are key people out there who are. I don't mean this rudely at all, but you know they're vocal about their love of fin of of, of flex nibs. Um, but there are an awful lot of people out there that don't really care whether it flexes or not. Um, and so the, they're, they give you a sort of fairly soft experience on the page, but there is an added bonus that they will give you a bit of line variation if that's what you need, but they're not flexing it. Um, I haven't got a, the, um, I have got a palladium one here inked. No, I haven't got it inked up, but that's a palladium one. Um, oh, there we are. But again, you can see there's uh, a fair bit of play in that. Um, and they give you a, 
a, a much softer experience on the page. That's beautifully smooth and nice and soft. Um, and again, you can get a good bit of line variation out of them, but they're not meant to flex. They're just, it's the bonus. They'll give you line variation. Um, whereas that titanium one is, it is meant to flex, but it's not going to flex anything like as much as, I keep writing off camera, I'm sorry. It's not going to flex anything like as much as, um, as a full flex nib. Uh, right, well, uh, oh, I'll show you this as well, look, while we're here. There's a size eight. If anybody's into um, John Garnham's, let me just get that out of the way. Um, wow. That's the 060. <laughs> <laughs> There's a size six. Um, I I haven't got one inked up. I have got a JG8 here, actually. I could put it in, but I had I didn't ink it up. Um, so uh, and it, the the I I need to make a comment about those as well. You can can you see that flexing there? Again, mm -hmm. they are they'll give you a soft experience and they'll give you a line variation. And it's tempting to think that because it's a bigger nib, that it's going to give you more line variation than a smaller nib. And it doesn't really. It's there's more metal in it, which is going to prevent it from doing it in the first place. Um, it's but it, it's got that joyous feel on the page. That's the point. And you're a long way from the paper. I have to point out with a size eight nib because it's 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 a big nib. Here's a here's a um, just there's one in a housing for you. Um, you know it it's a long nib. Um, so you have to if you're one of these people that likes holding your pen right down near the paper, don't go for a size eight nib because you're, you'd have to hold the nib. Um, <laughs> but, but it's tempting to think because it's a bigger nib, it's going to be that much softer and it's going to give you much more line variation. And it doesn't. They give you a similar line variation to a size six. Um, and it's a similar effort to get it out of it, you know, to get that, to get those nuances out of it. But the, the whole point about a, um, a size eight is, is really, you know, in livery and experience. And I suppose there's a, there's a bit of blinginess attached to them as well. Um, but yeah, they are a bit of fun. I don't I don't have the writing skills to get the best out of those or a flex nib for that, honest. I try not to write in public at all really because it's just, it's embarrassing. My writing is so bad that actually my dog a couple of years ago, I think probably my wife helped my dog, but my dog gave me a book on how to improve my handwriting. Um, which I, I still haven't had a chance to read, I'm afraid. But anyway, I can do I can do almost straight squiggly lines. Look. Um, anyway, there we are. I, I just just to put those sizes in perspective for you. That was all. I don't want to start going into. Well, I can if you want, but I I wasn't going to go into the nuances of different metals and and uh, and performance on the page and that kind of thing. Suffice to say that um, if it's a steel nib, albeit plain steel or plated with something or lacquered in a colour, its performance and, and experience on the page is going to be similar across the board. So a, a, a gold plated nib is the same nib underneath as, as this one. Um, not that one because that's solid gold, but um, a gold plated or a bicoloured nib or anything with a, you know, a red lacquer on it and that kind of thing. They're all going to behave the same way. Um, it's only when you start going away from that and getting into the titaniums and the, and the, and the upper echelons of the periodic table that uh, you start getting a different experience on the page. But you also tend to get a better, better ink flow with a precious metal nib. Um, the, the, the interaction um, of the ink between the feed and the, and the nib itself, uh, you tend to get a wetter flow with a gold nib or a palladium nib than you do with a steel nib. Um, so it's worth bearing that in mind as well. But the softer the metal, the easier it is to spring them. Right, so anyway, there we are. Quick question, Phil. Yeah. Uh, do you have to happen to know why Bok doesn't make the number eight in steel as well? Um, watch this space. Hmm? Well, it, it's, it's not going to happen soon, but it's, it, we have been talking with them about it, yeah. It would be lovely, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> Screwboy's uh, there punching. Is he? Um, 
the a lot of it is to is down to demand um and again this is this is where we have had a bit of influence because we've built a demand basically um and the demand has come through pen makers we when we first started um selling bot nibs we used to keep maybe i don't know five 18 carat size eights in each size we sell that in a week now um you know the demand is the demand has is, is gone up so much and also i suppose people are more savvy and and you know a, a lot of them i have to say go to the far east but well not quite the far east a lot of them end up on the indian subcontinent um but yeah we do sell a lot more of them now than we used to a few years ago so the demand is definitely there um and it really is just boils down to whether we can persuade them enough to commission them to to make them it, we're going to have to assess the demand because commissioning nibs from them is quite a substantial financial investment um because we have to get a lot made at a time um but yeah it's something we've been talking with them about and it may or may not happen i hope it will it's great great news <laughs> uh can you go back to your camera and announce yeah, the winners for us please yeah, yeah have i got a message somewhere then yes facebook messenger all right okay Right, there we are then. Um, well, the winners of tonight's bottles of um, citrus, first edition, are Ryan Curtis, Patrick Simon Perillo, and PJ Morris. Congratulations to all three. Yay. And there we are. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for sharing all the knowledge with us. Well, it, uh, yeah. uh, I'm pretty sure I don't speak for myself only. Uh, you know, everyone here has learned a lot. No, that well, was really good, Phil. Thanks very much for that. And the, the bit, seeing the nibs side by side really was a bit of a revelation do as well. Do you want well. to see another one? Do you want to see another <laughs> one? This is where he pulls out fire. <laughs> I want to see the cartridge that goes with that. <laughs> I want to see the pen. <laughs> yeah, I want to see the pen. One, there's, there's an A6O look. Okay. Uh, I want to see you writing with it. Uh, <laughs> Dan, I'm, I'm, I'm going to commission one a, a pen with Dan for that nib. Yeah, one of these days. <laughs> I have promised myself one of these days. It actually, just, it, it's, it's just a sort of showpiece. You know, Bob gave us this a, a few years ago. <laughs> Um, it is all engraved and everything. It's, um, it's, but it, what it hasn't got is the slit cut. It, the slit is just an engraving. Um, but one of these days, I will, when I've got nothing better to do, which will be probably when I'm too old to do it, um, I will cut a slit in that and I will make a feed for it and I'll turn a pen to, yes. to, to put that in. Yes. And it's the sort of thing that you're going to get at fates and things, isn't it? You know, who can, who can, you know, we could, we could raise money with it anyway, couldn't you? could do some good work with it, I think. You're going to be knighting people. <laughs> Arise a pen. Yes. I know that's bigger than mine. Yeah, yeah. Mine's bigger than yours, now. <laughs> If you're gonna, if you're gonna do any pen waving, buddy, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different group. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's Thursdays. Yes, that's Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it was a wonderful night with you. Phil it was brilliant. Thank with everyone. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks again, Phil. Lovely talk. Um, Thanks, congratulations to the winners. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Bernardo. Yeah, it's great fun. Welcome. Thanks, Bernardo. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you, Bernardo. See, See you guys. guys. All the best. Good night. See you guys Good tomorrow night. at night. See you tomorrow. Thank Take you. Care. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.